are knocking this climate change icon off its pedestal. So the polar bear has been an icon for global warming, climate change, and reduced sea ice since the turn of this century. And because of what they're calling the um, Arctic amplification effect, we're told that the Arctic has been uh, warming twice as fast as the rest of the world, and the mighty polar bear is the canary in the coal mine for climate change. This way? Okay. Um, so in 2012, Time magazine had an article featured the polar bear on its cover predicting a, an Arctic meltdown, proclaiming the polar bear was in danger and so was the rest of us. By 2016, they were telling us we should be very worried because the, the planet was undergoing remarkable changes and that we were all in danger at a tipping point. So from this point forward, virtually any news report that came out, whether it had to do with polar bears or not, featured a picture of a polar bear. Now, we've been given concerns about polar bear survival for so long now that most people probably can't even remember when it started or why. So I thought that I would begin at the point where the polar bear um, conservation status changed from being um, threatened by overhunting to threatened because of climate change. So let's look at the, the evolution of that um, conservation status. So the polar bear specialist group was instituted in 1968 um, as part of the IUCN, the um, International Union for the Conservation of Nature, that makes the, puts together the red list, which has been um, commented upon before. And the polar bear specialist group in 1973 helped broker an international treaty to protect the polar bears against overhunting. And this was, if not the first, one of the very first such international treaties of this kind. But still, it wasn't until 1982 that the bear was formally listed as vulnerable by the IUCN on the red list. And it stayed that way until 1996. And by that time, the, the polar bear numbers had rebounded quite um, spectacularly, and so they had pretty much doubled um, from their um, 1960s numbers, and they were downlisted to lower risk, or what's now called least concern. The polar bear had been saved, but I don't think very many people ever heard about that. But it stayed at this lower risk, least concerned, position for the next 10 years. But it was clear from reading reports of the polar bear specialist group that they were not very happy to have their species demoted. So they made a concerted effort in 2006. They thought, you know, if we could project uh, a decline in polar bear numbers based on these predictions of sea ice loss, we think that we can justify having them put back up to vulnerable. And in fact, the um, red list people accepted their recommendation that this be done, despite the fact that there was no scientific analysis done. This was just their collective opinion that they had given that within 30 years, or within 45 years, that 30% um, of there might be a 30% decline in polar bear numbers by that time. So in 2006, when the Red List folks made their yearly announcement about the um, animals that were being added to the Red List, they featured two common species the polar bear and the common hippo. <laughs> <laughs> 
the polar bear whose um, status was based on a, an opinion of a group of biologists that within 45 years, 30% of the population might decline, and the common hippo, who had suffered a 95% decline in actual numbers in the Congo. One species based on actual catastrophic local decline, another one based on a prophecy. Now, what's significant about this listing of the polar bear in 2006 is that it had never been done. No organization had ever listed a species based on this kind of future threat. So the polar bear was the first species that this was tried with. It has now been done with several other species, but the polar bear was the test case, basically, for having this done. And then the next year, American biologists with the U.S. Geological Survey um, had developed models where, that were predicting um, that most of the polar bears in the world would be dead by 2050 because of sea ice loss. Now, this model used, it was a Bayesian network model, if I've got that pronunciation right, and so those of you who are modelers will know what that means. It basically means that most of the assumptions that are put into the model are, in fact, the opinions of this one man. What he thought the polar bears would do if the sea ice declined. Now, what's important to keep in mind at this point is that sea ice had never declined to the levels they were predicting, so it had never happened. So he was guessing. He was giving his expert opinion based on what he knew about polar bears of what would happen, but he had no data to base this on. And the other important um, criteria for, for these predictions was that it used only summer sea ice levels. And part of the reason for this is that the spring, fall, and winter uh, projections weren't, by 2100, weren't predicted to decline much at all. So only the summer was, protect, was predicted to decline in a dramatic fashion. And because of that, it meant that biologists really had no, um, uh, um, no recourse but to focus all of their attention on making um, summer an important survival season, even if there was no biological basis for that. So by 2008, polar bears were duly listed as um, threatened on the U.S. endangered species list, and we had the massive media coverage that followed. Now, if we look at what the predictions at that time, so most of these, the sea ice predictions that the biologists were using had actually been developed in 2005. So these were some of the um, models that they used in their, in their projections that they came up with for um, what the ice might be like in 2050. There were a number of this, this is just one example. And this, from one of the climate assessments reports from 2005, um, this is what they had um, predicted. So um, this, it's a bit difficult to see, but this is, um, this lighter bit here is the 2050 line that was pre predicted. So that's what they were using um, as, as their um, data. So... What they came up with for the polar bear predictions was that two-thirds of the world's polar bears were predicted to disappear when summer sea ice dropped below five million kilometers square in eight out of ten years, which would have been about a 42% decline from 1979 levels. This meant a loss of about 16,400 bears a decline 
from about 24,500 to only 8,100. Now, the 8,100 was would actually have been fewer bears that than were present in the late 1960s when the bears were listed first listed and protected um, from overhunting. And in geographical terms, what this meant was they were predicting all of the bears in this purple area here from Alaska all the way to Svalbard and this green area here in Davis Strait, Barrent Strait, um, er, and um, Hudson Bay. So in all, they were predicting the demise of 10 entire subpopulations out of the 19 that were present worldwide. So a huge decline. And the problem was, even before the ink was dry on their report, the sea ice dropped to 2050 levels. And this is um, a graphic taken from the peer-reviewed uh, version of the government report. So it was published in 2008. So it actually had included the image that had the September minimum um, sea ice graphic. And what this one over here is showing is the sea ice predictions for 2050, the 10 of the models that they used, which were all a little bit different. This red line is the sea ice at 2007. And what it's showing is that, in fact, the, the ice level in September 2007 had dropped below five of the best models that they had that were expected at 2050. Now, we know that they know. They knew at the time that they produced this report because they included in the report this very similar graphic, which actually included an ice map of August 23rd, 2007, with this same diagram showing essentially the same result, but just quite not quite as, as far. And what um, Stephen Anstrup, in his um, remarks about this, uh, concluded was that because of this dramatic decline sooner than expected, it meant that his predictions for the demise of the polar bear were likely um, very, um, very conservative meaning that either the decline of the bears was going to happen sooner than expected, or it was going to be even more extreme than they had predicted. And actually, a couple of years later, this important paper came out um, by Wang and Overland, um, dealing with the summer sea ice extent. And they were looking at just those two years and determined that the ice had declined at least 30 years sooner than expected. So it actually is an important confirmation of my interpretation that the ice had come down to the levels that weren't expected until 2050. And they concluded that, in fact, an ice-free Arctic by 2040 was very likely. And then all of the media in this particular story, we had a, a, pull, a um, conservation um, activist saying the polar bears are going to drown, they're going to starve, they're going to resort to cannibalism, they're going to become extinct. Now, part of the, the going to become extinct part of it actually comes from the other part of the um, USGS prediction, and that was that when the ice hit um, was completely ice-free in summer, which they didn't expect at that time until 2100, that the bears would be virtually extinct by that time. However, what happened was the ice didn't continue to decline. It actually rather stabilized. And so between 2007 and 2016, the ice basically stayed well, with some variation between three and five million kilometers squared, but still at about these 2050 levels. And in fact, just as you know, an aside to point out that since then, the ice has continued to stay at within those bounds 
And one of the things that was interesting to me was to discover when the um, U.S. National Snow and Ice Data Center um, put out their report at the end of September telling us all the bad things that had happened with the ice for this year at the sea ice minimum, they included this graph, which actually shows quite clearly that the steepest part of the sea ice dec de um, decline happened between 1999 and 2012. So that's the really dramatic decline in red, but that since 2007 um, and up until 2019, the trend has been flat. And I think this is the first time I've actually seen this expressed in, in quite this way. And I haven't altered this graph in any way except to put the pink box around it. That's exactly the way it was presented. However, the problem was that the polar bear numbers did not decline as predicted. And this is a simple uh, um, one of the NASA graphs that shows the summer or the September ice from 1979 up to 2016. And the arrow here is marking 2005 when these uh, predictions were first made. And what you see is polar bear numbers going up about 16%. Now, 16% in, in uh, the overall picture of this is probably not statistically significant. However, it is definitely not a decline of two thirds. Sea ice went down the polar bear numbers went up. So, both the sea ice models and the polar bear models were spectacularly wrong. And what we ended up with at the present time is fat, healthy polar bears throughout the Arctic, but with much less summer ice than there had been since 1979. And this is actually a NASA graph and they're calling the reduction nearly 50%. And just to give you some exam um, a picture of some of the things that have, have gone on um, that we're seeing to account for some of the um, increase in numbers is um, mothers with triplets. Now, triplet litters are considered rare in any, anywhere throughout the Arctic except for Western Hudson Bay. Why? We don't know. It's one of the questions that was raised by biologists before this whole climate change thing became a big issue and they just let it slide. There wasn't really any investigation into why there were so many um, a high, such a high percentage of triplets produced in Western Hudson Bay compared to everywhere else. Um, but that was, that was the pattern. Rare throughout the Arctic, except in the really highly productive um, Western Hudson Bay. But here we've got um, a mother, fat mother with very healthy, fat but dirty, um, triplet cubs in the southern Beaufort in the summer of 2016. And this one is a Chukchi C female who has year-old triplets in 2010. And then this one is, a, again, another Chukchi C female um, on the shore of Wrangell Island in 2017. And the point really is that when conditions are good, that more females in the population will be able to raise triplets to at least nine months um, or older. Now, the flip side of that is the starving bear stories that we hear so much about. And I'm sure you remember this image that was flashed around a few years ago, and in fact, it still is being circulated. And National, National Geographic was responsible for circulating the video that this um, still came from. And in fact, they claimed that this was what climate change looked like. Now, what was remarkable to me was how strong the backlash was against this message. And in fact, ultimately, 
they had to retract it, that statement, and apologize. Um, because, in fact, it wasn't true. And I have been saying that that's not true for several years. And what happens is that polar bears starve when they're sick or injured. That's one of the things. If they can no longer hunt, if they can no longer compete effectively, then they will starve. If they're young, inexperienced bears, not very good at hunting, or if they're old and weak and can't um, have trouble catching the seals, or else defending their kills from bigger, stronger bears. In other words, there's a lot of competition going on there, and if you're a weak bear, you may be able to catch a seal, but you're not going to be able to always keep it. And that's a problem, but it's, it's what happens in, in all bear species. And ultimately, starvation is the leading natural cause of death for polar bears. And the, a single starving bear doesn't tell you anything about the rest of the population is doing. So let me just um, get into a bit about why the models were so wrong, because this, it's important to try and understand how, how the biologists could have been so far off in their predictions. And one of them is that because of the way that their, their models were constructed, they put a lot of emphasis on summer survival and summer hunting, and it turned out that summer hunting is simply much less important than they assumed. And the other thing that happened was that it turned out less ice in the summer was a very clear benefit to seals. Both ring seals and bearded seals, which are the primary prey species of polar bears, do most of their feeding in the open water season in summer. So if that season is longer, they can feed longer. And they become then in better condition are more apt to, to give birth to healthy pups the following spring, and then that produces um, more he healthy seal pups for the polar bears to eat in spring when they need it. And so ultimately, what it came down to was that spring hunting for polar bears was much more important than the models um, took into account, because they didn't take spring into account at all. And Therefore, that spring sea ice conditions were much more important than summer ice conditions, also not taken into account in the models because they were so focused on summer. Now, these conclusions are based on research that has been done by polar, the polar bear researchers that go out in the field and collect the data and have published it in the peer-reviewed literature. And so this is not simply my, my conclusion. These are, it's based on um, clear results with, with data um, that are in the literature. And so what I did when I realized that this was all coming together, I wrote a scientific paper, um, and I published it in a, uh, with a um, preprint scientific preprint server. Now, I had tried to get it um, into the peer-reviewed literature. Um, the first time, it, uh, I got one positive review and one from the polar bear biologist who was obviously consulted, who just um, said everything, everything was wrong, actually except for this part of the paper, this hypothesis testing part. And so I sent it off to some other colleagues, uh, another polar bear researcher that I know who's um, a, a bit more open-minded about these things, and some other biological colleagues of mine took their feedback into account, modified, you know, adjusted the paper, and put it out in this form. And, but before I, I actually published it this way, I did send it out to another journal, and the response from the editor was that he felt that I should um, contact Dr. Amstrup, who had developed the model, 
and, and put together a collaboration with him to actually test whether his model was correct, which I thought, well, that was really a pie-in-the-sky kind of <laughs> request. Um, however, it, it, it's important perhaps to point out that you know this, we're talking about the fact that the polar bear specialty is a very small group of people and they are all on the same page. And, and because it's considered um, a highly specialized field, then there is undoubtedly no journal in the world that if presented a paper about polar bear conservation, um, that they wouldn't send it to at least one of, one of those members. And there's no way that they would ever let it through. So I decided that I would publish it online. If they wanted to comment and, and criticize it, they were open to the, this particular um, preprint server has a space for, for comments and discussion and no one said a word. Not one of them made any kind of comment at all. And, but I laid it out as a hypothesis um, to test because this is an appropriate format for presenting a scientific criticism. And in fact, you don't have to put a collar on a polar bear to assess whether a prediction made in 2007 matched up with documented observations taken since then. However, in late November 2007, I woke up to find this paper promoted by media outlets worldwide and found that I was, in fact, the objective of this paper. And of the 14 co-authors listed here, I only recognized five of them. Ian Sterling is the leading senior polar bear biologist in Canada. Stephen Amstrup is the one that put together the USGS model. Michael Mann, I think you all know because he thinks so highly of himself. Um, Stephen Lewinowski, who's a psychologist, Australian psychologist, and Eric Post, I'd run across his name in biology papers. But the rest of them, I'd never heard of. I have no idea who they are. Um, however, the ultimate um, goal of this was to um, silence my scientific criticism. Um, I mean, you only have to read the paper to see that. You know, there was no effort made whatsoever to address any of the criticisms that I had made. And it was really a very vindictive attack meant to publicly discredit me. And they, they also included, you know, disparaging remarks about other internet blogs and sort of smeared my, this new bad reputation they'd created for me, smeared it liberally around the internet as, f as far as they could make it go. Um, and, you know, the media just fell in line with this and really fell over backwards um, writing about it. New York Times. And then it turned out that the University of Victoria, where I w was working, was busy doing some silencing of its own. Um, by the time that Harvey paper had come out, I'd been expelled from the university's Speakers Bureau. Um, and this, this is um, uh, an organization they'd put together to allow professors, graduate students, to go out in the community and give lectures to school children, to various community groups, that kind of thing. And I had been um, working with them since 2009, giving lectures about polar bears, but also about evolution. And so, but in 2016, I had added a polar bear lecture specifically for middle school children because I had been requested for such a lecture by teachers time and time again. They were begging me to come and talk to their children about polar bears. So I did it. The, the head of the Speakers Bureau happily included this and she said this is going to be really popular and in fact I was giving a number of um, lectures to classes that year. However, when it came time to renew 
um, my involvement, which they do, did every year, um, they came and said that I needed the um, permission of the chair of my department before I could continue uh, my involvement, and the chair of the department said no. She cl it was claimed that my talks um, lacked balance. And really, there was no mention of polar bears. It was very carefully worded. Um, but as far as I was aware, there were, had been no complaints from parents, from children, from teachers, from anyone. And it was pretty clear to me that there had been pressure. Someone from outside the university had complained to the uh, president, and it trickled down to the chair of my department, and they made it clear that they wanted me gone. And this became, began my academic hanging that went on be behind closed nor doors. I didn't know any of this that was going on. And then this summer, my department refused to renew my adjunct status that I'd held for 15 years, and they refused to say why. And the university has since refused to answer any questions from a journalist. And um, some of you may know that um, an article or a, an op-ed came out um, earlier this week um, detailing what has gone on here to, just to make this public. And the point is really that adjunct professors have no rights. I, it's an unpaid position. Um, and so this was an entirely legal action, but it was really a uh, scholarly, unethical attack on my academic freedom. However, here I am. <laughs> so I'm not about to be silenced, and... Um, I'm just trying to take all of these things in my stride. But let's go on to what I think is maybe a, a, a really the bigger question that no one else has yet addra addressed, and that is how many polar bears are there really out there? Because what I've noticed is that for years, the polar bear specialist group has really been um, minimizing the population estimates. And the, the, I mean, we know that there hasn't been um, official surveys done in a number of areas like East Greenland. Some of the areas in Russia haven't, ha haven't had an official survey. And so rather than using the information they've collected over the last 50 years to make some kind of a ballpark estimate, they just refuse to do anything. They just ignore it as if there were zero bears there. And what they're essentially saying is that um, the population doubled up to about 1995-96 and then has stayed flat ever since. And I contend that that's actually biologically implausible, is that every other species that we have protected uh, from overhunting has gone recovered in a quite dramatic fashion, and that in, it's much more likely that the population has, in fact, continued to rise to something on the order of 40,000 in 2018. And my estimate then, going back and w doing what I think they should have done, which is to look at, say, the area of Greenland, look at the other areas that are similar to it, look at what's been happening there, and try to make a credible estimate for what the numbers are likely to be in those areas. The same for Russia. And when I do that and add it to the numbers for the areas where we do have relatively good numbers, then what we get is um, an average of about 39,000 with a range of about 26,000 to 58,000. Now, what the... IUCN, the, the latest red list assessment in 2015, put the estimate at 22,000 to 31,000. So, you know, we're not hugely far off. And that's what I said. You know, 
this, this, may, this estimate of 40,000 or even 58,000 as a maximum might seem outrageous, but one of the things that I noticed was back in 1986, Ian Sterling stated there was probably about 40,000 bears in the world at that time when you took the areas in the world where they didn't have a known count into account. So he did what I did in 1986 and came up with 40,000. So 39,000 I don't think is an implausible um, estimate and may in fact be quite conservative since it's been th more than 30 years since he made his estimate. So I'm suggesting that there in fact is no climate emergency for polar bears and that the canary in the coal mine for climate change turned out to be an outstanding survivor. <laughs> and what this means for Arctic residents, the Arctic is now full of bears, they're dangerous predators, that they kill people and damage property in their relentless quest for food. Even fat bears kill people and damage property. They're a danger year-round, in Svalbard, just some examples, um, July 2018, you may remember um, a guard from a cruise ship, um, an armed guard was attacked by this emaciated bear and was only saved by, of being um, killed or critically mauled um, by his companion who was able to shoot it. And they were looking for bears and still got attacked. They were armed and still got attacked. Um, these two bears in 2016 closed down an archaeological dig when they decided that they, they were going to do a bit of exploring on their own. Um, an isolated cabin in 2017 that was broken into, you can see the door was ripped off the hinges and the contents ransacked. And then just last month, A couple of fellows went out for a boating trip, took the dinghy ashore to have lunch and go for a bit of a walk. Bear swam over, climbed in the boat, did a number on the inside of the boat. Now, you can, I think you can see enough of this bear to um, understand that he's a healthy bear. He's, um, he's not in any distress. And, but in fact, in the newspaper account I came across, it was blamed on climate change, as virtually all of these incidents are these days, even though in Svalbard this year, as has been pointed out um, recently, the, the, um, the sea ice has been more extensive and thicker than it's been in decades. And it's, uh, so it's pretty far-fetched. And in just about every instance where I've looked at the details of one of these attacks or, or problems, um, you find that the uh, claim of um, sea ice decline or, or sea ice loss being an issue um, really doesn't stand up. So I'll just run through the points. Summer sea ice is not crucial for polar bear, polar bear health and survival. Less ice in summer is beneficial to ring and bearded seals, the prey of polar bears. Since 2005, even though the ice dropped to 2050 levels, the polar bear numbers didn't plummet. As expected, the populations are now the highest they've been in 50 to 60 years. And to, since 2005, polar bear specialists have repeatedly underestimated the global population size and that the global population size may be as high as 39,000, but officially is 26,000. And thriving polar bear populations put the safety of Arctic residents and visitors at risk. And persecuting me for telling children that polar bears are not currently on the brink of extinction, when this is undeniably true, is an attempt to silence legitimate scientific criticism. And it just weakens the whole concept of human-caused climate change, as far as I'm concerned. And despite summer sea ice loss, there is no climate change, climate emergency for polar bears. And if there's no climate emergency for polar bears, means there's no climate emergency, period.
thank you. And I'll just point out that these are the books I had brought with me, but, and most of them are they're gone now. I think there's a few of the English copies of the Facts and Myths, but they are available on um, Amazon, and the um, Catastrophe book is also available as a Kindle e-book um, if you're interested, so, and those stickers are free. Thank you. <laughs>